The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay. Let's start with our uh, standard uh, starting point of the last few lectures. That is, uh, we are looking at some system. We just try to describe it by some kind of a uh, field, statistical field after some averaging. That is a function of uh, position. And we are interested in calculating something like a partition function by integrating over all configurations of this statistical field. And uh, these uh, configurations have some kind of a weight. This weight we choose to write as exponential of some kind of a uh, something like an effective Hamiltonian that depends on the configuration that you are looking at. And of course, the main thing faced with the problem that you haven't seen before is to decide on what the field is that you are looking at to average and what kind of symmetries and the constraints you want to construct in this form of the weight. In particular, we are sort of uh, focusing on this Landau-Ginsberg model that describes phase transitions. And let's say in the absence of magnetic field, we are interested in a system that is rotationally symmetric. Uh, but the procedure is reasonably standard. Maybe in some cases, you can solve a particular part of this. Uh, let's call that part beta h0. In the context that uh, we are working with, it's the Gaussian part that we have looked at before. So that's the integral over space. We use this idea of locality. We had an expansion in all things that are cons uh, consistent with this. But uh, for the purposes of the exactly solvable part, we focus on the Gaussian. So there is a term that is proportional to m squared, gradient of m squared, and higher order terms. So clearly, for the time being, I'm ignoring the magnetic field. So let's say, in this formulation, the problem that we are interested in is how our partition function depends on this coefficient, which when it goes to 0, the Gaussian weight becomes uh, kind of uh, unsustainable. Now, of course, we said that uh, the full problem has, in addition to this beta h0, a part that involves the interaction. So what I have done is I have written the weight as a beta h0 and a part that is an interaction. By interaction, I really mean something that is not uh, uh, solvable within the framework of Gaussian. In our case, what was non-solvable is essentially anything, and there's infinity of terms, that don't have second order powers of uh, m. So we wrote terms like m to the fourth, m to the sixth, and so forth. Okay. Now the key to being able to solve this problem was to make a transformation to Fourier modes. So essentially what we did was to write our m of x as a sum over Fourier modes. We could write it, let's say, in the discrete form as e to the i q dot x. And whether I write e to the i q dot x or minus i q dot x is not important as long as I'm consistent within one session at least. Uh, and the normalization that I used was 1 over v. 
And the reason I used this normalization was that if I went to the continuum, I could write it nicely as an integral over Q divided by the density of states. The V would disappear, uh, e to the i q x, m tilde of Q. Okay. Now, in particular, if I do that transformation, the Gaussian part simply becomes uh, 1 over v sum over q. Then the Fourier transform of this kernel, t plus k q squared, and so forth, divided by 2 m of q discrete squared, which if I go to the continuum limit, simply becomes an integral over q, p plus k q squared, and so forth, over 2, m of q squared. Okay. Now, once I have the Gaussian weight, from the Gaussian weight, I can calculate various averages. And uh, the averages are best described by noting that essentially, after this transformation, I can also write my weight as a product over the contributions of the different modes of something that is of this form, e to the minus beta h0. Now, written in terms of these q modes, clearly it's a product of independent contributions. And then, of course, there will be the u to be added later on. But when I have a product of independent contributions for each q, I can immediately see that if I look at, say, m evaluated for some q, m evaluated for some different q with the Gaussian weight. And when I calculate things with the Gaussian weight, I put this index 0. So that's my 0 to order or exactly solvable theory. And of course, we are dealing here with the vector. So these things have indices, alpha and beta, associated with them. And if I look at the discrete version, I have a product over Gaussians for each one of them. Clearly, I will get 0 unless I'm looking at the same components. And I'm looking at the same q. And in particular, the constraint really is that q plus q prime should add up to 0. And if those constraints are satisfied, then I'm looking at a particular term in this Gaussian. And the expectation value of m squared is simply the variance that we can see is v divided by t plus kq squared at q to the fourth and so forth. And the thing is that most of the time we will actually be looking at things directly in the limit of the continuum where we replace sums over q's with integrals over q. And then we have to replace this discrete delta function with the continuum de delta function. And the procedure to do that is that this becomes delta alpha beta. This combination gets replaced by 2 pi to the d, a delta function q plus q prime, where this is now a Dirac delta function p plus k q squared plus L q to the fourth and so forth. And the justification for doing that is simply that uh, the Kronecker delta is defined such that if I sum over, let's say, all q, the delta that is Kronecker, uh, the answer would be 0. Now, if I go to the continuum limit, 
the sum over q I have to replace with integral over q with a density of states, which is v divided by 2 pi to the d. Okay. So if I want to replace this with a continuum delta function of q, I have to get rid of this 2 pi to the d over v. And that's what I have done. So basically, uh, you replace, hopefully I didn't make a mistake. Uh, Yes, so the discrete delta I replace with 1 over v. The v disappears, and the 2 pi to the d appears. OK? Now, the thing that makes some difficulty is that whereas the rest of these things that we have not included as part of the Gaussian because of the locality, I could write reasonably simply in the space x. When I go to the space q, it becomes complicated. Because each m of x here, I have to replace with a sum or an integral. And I have four of those m's. So here, let's say for the first term that involves u, I have, in principle, to go over an integral associated with conversion of the first m, conversion of the second m, third m. Each one of them will carry a factor of 2 pi to the d, so there will be three of them. And the reason I didn't write the fourth one is because after I do all of that transformation, I will have an integral over x of e to the i q1 dot x plus q2 dot x plus q3 dot x plus q4 dot x. So I have an integral of e to the i q dot x, where q is the sum of the four of them, over x. And that gives me a delta function that ensures the sum of the four q's have to be 0. So basically, uh, one of the m's will carry now index q1. The other will carry index q2. The third will carry index q3. The fourth will carry index that is minus q1, minus q2, minus q3. Yes? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter which one, like indices for like squaring it or whatever. Uh, uh, sorry, like, do you need a subscript for like alpha and beta? OK, that's what I was coming. So this m to the fourth is really m squared, m squared, where m squared is a vector that is squared. So I have to put the indices, let's say alpha, alpha, that are summed over all possibility to get the dot product here. And I have to put the indices beta, beta, to have the dot products here. OK? Now, when I go to the next term, clearly I will have a whole bunch more integrals and things like that. So the u terms do not look as nice and clean. They were local in real space. But when I go to this Fourier space, they become non-local. Qs that are all over this Brillouin zone are going to be coupled to each other through this expression. And that's also why it is called interaction, because in some sense, previously, each q was a mode by itself. And these terms give interactions between uh, modes that have different q's. Yes? Is there a way to understand that physically of why um, you get coupling in Fourier space uh, to higher than uh, you know, quadratic? OK. So essentially, we have a system that is, uh, has translational symmetry. So when you have translational symmetry, this Fourier vector q is a good conserved quantity. It's like a momentum. Okay? And so 
one thing that we have is in some sense a particle or an excitation that is going by itself with some particular uh, momentum. But what these terms represent is the possibility that you have, let's say, two of these momenta coming and interacting with each other and getting two that are going out. Why is it true to two? It's partly because of the symmetries that we built into the problem. If I had written something that was m cubed, I had the possibility of two going to one or one going to two, etc. Okay. All right. Uh, I forgot to say one more thing, which is that for the Gaussian theory, I can calculate essentially all expectation values most nicely in this context of the Fourier representation. So this was an example of something that had two factors of m. But very soon, we will see that we would need terms that, let's say, involve m factors of n that are multiplied each other. So I have m alpha i of qi, some, something like that. And again, 0 for the Gaussian expectation value. And if I've written things the way that I have, that is, I have no magnetic field, so I have m2 minus m symmetry, clearly the answer is going to be 0 if L is odd, if L is even, we have this nice property of Gaussians that we described in A333, which is that this will be the sum over all pairs of averages. So something like M1, M2, M3, M4. You can have M1, M2 multiplying by M3, M4 average, M1, M3 average multiplying M2, M4 average, M1, M4 average multiplied by M2, M3 average. And this is what's called the Wick's theorem, which is an important property of the Gaussian that we will use. Okay. So we know how to calculate averages of things of interest, which are essentially product of these factors of m in the Gaussian theory. Now let's calculate these averages in perturbation theory. So quite generally, if I want to calculate the average of some O in a theory that involves averaging over some functional, so this could be some trace, some completely uh, unspecified things, of a weight that is like, say, e to the minus beta h0, a part that I can do and a part that I want to treat as a small change to what I can do. The procedure of calculating the average is to multiply the probability by the quantity that I want to average. And of course, the whole thing has to be properly normalized. And this is the normalization, which is the partition function that we had previously. Okay. Now, the whole idea of perturbation is to assume that this quantity u is small. So we start to expand e to the minus u. I can certainly do that very easily. Let's say in the denominator, I have e to the minus beta h0. And then I have 1 minus u plus u squared over 2 minus u cubed over 6, basically the usual expansion of the exponential. In the numerator, I have the same thing, except that there is an O that is multiplying this expansion for the operator. 
or the object that I want to calculate average. Okay. Now, the first term that I have in the denominator here, one multiplied by all integrals of e to the minus h zero, is clearly what I would call the partition function, or the normalization that I would have for the Gaussian weight. So that's the first term. If I factor that out, then the next term is u integrated against the Gaussian weight and then properly normalized. So the next term will be the average of u with the Gaussian or whatever other zero to order weight is that I can calculate things and I have added indicated that by zero. And then I would have one half average of u squared zero and so forth. And the series in the numerator once I factor out the z0 is pretty much the same, except that every term will have an O. OK? The z0s, naturally, I can cancel out. And so what I have is from the numerator O, minus o u uh, plus one half o u squared. What I will do with the denominator is to bring it in the numerator regarding all of these as a small quantity. So if I were to essentially write this expression raised to the minus 1 power, I can make a series expansion of all of these terms. So the first thing, if I just had 1 over 1 minus u in the denominator, it would come from 1 plus u plus u squared and u cubed, etc. But I've only kept things to order of u squared. So when I then correct it because of this thing in the denominator, the 1 half becomes minus 1 half u squared 0. And then there will be order of u cubed terms. So the answer is the product of two brackets. And I can reorganize that product again in powers of u. The lowest order term is the zero to order or unperturbed average. And the first correction comes from OU average. And then I have the average of U, average of U. You can see that something like a, a variance or connected correlation or cumulant appears because I have to subtract out the average. And then the next order term, what will I have? I will write it as 1 half. I start with O u squared 0. Then I can multiply this with this. So I will get minus 2 O u 0 u 0. And then I can multiply O 0 with those two terms. So I will have minus O 0 u squared 0 plus 2 o 0. Uh, this is over here, u 0 squared, and higher order terms. OK? So basically, we can see that the coefficients as I have written, are going to be essentially the coefficients that I would have if I were to expand the exponential. So things like minus 1 to the n over n factorial. And the leading term in all cases is O u raised to the nth power 0, out of which are subtracted various things. And the effect of those subtractions 
let's say we define a quantity which is like the cumulants that we were using in uh, 8333, which describe the subtractions that you would have to define such an average. OK? So that's the general structure. What this really means, and I sometimes call it cumulant or connected, will become apparent very shortly. Okay. So this is the general result. We have a particular case above, which is this Landau-Ginzberg theory perturbed around the Gaussian. So let's calculate the simplest one of our averages, this m alpha of q, m beta of q prime. Not at the Gaussian level, but as a perturbation. And uh, actually, I'll, for practical per reasons, I will just calculate the effect of the first term, which is um to the fourth. So I will expand in powers of u. But once you see that, you would know how to do it for m to the sixth and all the higher powers. So according to what we have here, the first term is m alpha of q, m beta of q prime, evaluated with the Gaussian theory. The next term, this one, involves the average of this entity and the u. Okay? So r u, I have written up there. So I have minus from the first term. The terms that are proportional to u, I will uh, uh, group together, coming from here. u itself involves this integration over q1, q2, q3. And u involves this mi of q1, mi of q2, mj of q3, mj of minus q1, minus q2, minus q3. And I have to multiply it. So this is u. I have to multiply it by o. So I have m alpha of q m beta of q prime. So this is my O, this is my U. And I have to take the average of this term. But really, the average operates on the M's, so it will go over here. OK? So that's the average of O, U. I have to subtract from that the average of O, average of U. So let me again write. The next term, u, will be the same bunch of integrations. I have to do average of O and then average of u. This completes my first correction coming from u. And then there will be corrections to first order coming from v. There will be second order corrections coming from u squared, all kinds of things that will come into play. Okay? But the important thing, again, to realize is the structure. u is this thing that involves four factors of m. The averages are over the m, so I can take them within the integral. And so I have one case, which is the pro an expectation value of six m's. Another case, a product of two and a product of four. Okay, So that's why I said I would need to know 
how to calculate in the Gaussian theory product of various factors of m because my interaction term involves various powers of m that will be added to whatever expectation value I'm calculating perturbation theory. Okay? So how do I calculate an expectation that involves six factors, certainly it's even, of m? I have to group, make all possible pairings. So this, for example, can be paired to this. This can be paired to this. This can be paired to this. That's a perfectly well-defined average. But you can see that if I do this, if I pair this one, this one, this one, I will get something that will cancel out against this one. Right? So basically, you can see that any way that I do averaging that involves only things that are coming from O and separately the things that come from U will cancel out with the corresponding oops. with the corresponding averages that I do over here. Right? So that's where that C stands for connected. So the only things that survive are pairings or contractions that pick something that is from O and connect it to something that is from uh, U. And the purpose of all of these other terms at all higher orders is precisely to remove pieces where you don't have full connections among all of the O's and the U's that you are dealing with. Okay. So let's see what this is. So I will show you that using connections that involve both O and U, I will have two types of contractions joining O and U. Okay. The first type is something like this. I will again draw all or write down all of the fours. So I have M alpha of Q, M beta of Q prime, M i of Q one, M i of Q two, M j of Q three. Mj of minus q1 minus q2 minus q2. I have to take that average. And I do that average according to Vick's theorem as a product of contractions. So let's pick this m alpha. It has to ultimately be paired with somebody. I can't pair it with m beta because that's a self contraction and will get subtracted out. So I can pick any one of these fours. As far as I'm concerned, all fours are, four are the same. So I have a choice of four as to which one of these uh, four operators from U I connect to. So that four is one of the numerical factors that ultimately we have to take care of. Then the two types comes because the next M that I pick from O I have two possibilities. I can connect it either with the partner of the first one that also carries index i, or I can connect to one of the things that carries the opposite index j. So let's call type 1, where I make the choice that I connect to the partner. And once I do that, then I'm forced to connect these two together. Right? Now, each one of these pairings connects one of these averages. So I can write down what that is. So the first one connected an alpha to an i, as far as indices were concerned. It connected q to q1. So I have 2 pi to the d, a delta function q plus q1. And the variance associated with that 
which is t plus k uh, q squared, etc. The second pairing connects a beta to an i. So that's a delta beta i. And it connects q prime to q2. And so the variance associated with that is t plus k q prime squared and so forth. And finally, the third pairing connects j to itself j. So I will get a delta jj. And then I have 2 pi to the d q3 to minus q1 minus q2 minus q3. So I will get minus q1 minus q2. And then I have t plus, say, k q3 squared and so forth. Okay. Now, what I'm supposed to do is at the next stage, I have to sum over indices i and j and integrate over q1, q2, q3. Okay. So when I do that, what do I get? There is an overall factor of minus u. Uh, let's do the indices. When I sum over i, delta alpha i, delta beta i becomes, actually, let me put the factor of 4 before I forget it. There is a factor of 4 numerically. Uh, delta alpha i, delta beta i will give me a delta alpha beta. Uh, when I integrate over q1, q1 is set to minus q. So this, after the integration, becomes uh, q. When I integrate over q2, the delta function q2 forces minus q2 to be q prime. And through the process, two of these factors of 2 pi to the d get uh, dis uh, disappear. So what I'm left with is 2 pi to the d. This delta function now involves q plus q prime. And then in the denominator, I have this factor of t plus k q squared. I have t plus k q prime squared. Although q prime squared and q squared are the same, I could have collapsed these things together. I have one integration left over q3. And these two factors went outside the integral. They didn't depend on q3. The only thing that depends on q3 is t plus k q3 squared and so forth. Okay. So that was easy. Yes? If you're summing over uh, j, won't you get an n? Thank you very much. I forgot the delta j. j, summing over j, I will get a factor of n. So what I had written here as 4 should be 4n. Yes? OK. Again, go back all the way to here when we were doing the Gaussian integral. I will have for the first one q1. For the second m, I will write q2. So when I fully transform this term, I will have e to the i q1 plus q2 dot x. And then when I integrate over x, I will get a delta function q1 plus q2. So that's why I write all of these as absolute value squared, 
because I could have written this as m of q, m of minus q, but I realize that m of minus q is the complex conjugate of m of q. So all of these are absolute value squared. OK? Now the second class of contraction is, again, write the same thing. M alpha of Q, M beta of Q prime, M i of Q1, M j, uh, i of Q2, M j of Q3, M j of minus Q1, minus Q2, minus Q3. The first step is the same. I pick M alpha of Q, and I have no choice but to pick one of the four possibilities that I have for uh, the operators that appear in U. But for the second one, previously I chose to connect it to something that was carrying the same index. Now I choose to carry it to something that carries the other index, J in this case. And there are two things that carry index J. So I have two choices there. And then I have the remaining two have to be connected. Yes? Just going back a little bit, uh, you're, are you uh, assuming that your integral over Q3 converges because you're only integrating over the equivalent zone? Yes. OK. Yeah. That's right. I have any time I see a divergent integral, I have a reason to go back to my physics and see why uh, physics will avoid the infinities. And in this case, because all of my theories have an underlying length scale associated with them, and there is an associated maximum value that I can go in Fourier space. The only possible uh, singularities that I want to get are coming from q goes to 0. And again, if I really want to physically cut that off, I would put the size of the system. But I'm interested in systems that become infinite in size. OK? So the first term for this way of contracting things uh, is, uh, again, let's, I should, uh, is as follows. There are eight such terms. As I should have really put the four here. There are eight such types of contractions. Uh, then I have a delta alpha i, 2 pi to the d delta function q plus q1 divided by t plus k q squared and so forth. The first contraction is exactly the same as before. The next contraction, I connect i to j and q2 to uh, q prime to q3. So I have a delta beta j, 2 pi to the d, delta function q prime going to q3, divided by t plus k q prime squared, and so forth. And the last contraction connects an i to a j, delta i j. I have uh, 2 pi to the d connecting q2 to minus q1 minus q2 minus q3 will give me a delta function, which is minus q1 minus q3. And then I have t plus k, I guess in this case, q2 squared and so forth. OK? So once more, sum ij integrate q1, q2, q3. And let's see what happens. So again, it's a, it's a term that is proportional to minus u. The numerical coefficient that it carries is 8. And there is no n here, because when I sum over i, you can see that j is said to be the same as alpha. Then when I sum over j, 
I set alpha to be the same as beta. So there is just a delta alpha beta. When I integrate over q1, q1 is set to minus q. q3 is set to minus q prime. So this factor becomes the same as q plus q prime. And the two variances, which are in fact the same, I can continue to write as separate entities, but they're really the same thing. And then the one integral that is left, I did q1 and q3. It's then integral over q2, 2 pi to the d, 1 over t plus k, q2 squared, and so forth. It is, in fact, exactly the same integral as before, except that the name of the dummy integration variable has changed from uh, q2 to q3, or q3 to q2. OK? So we've calculated m alpha of q, m beta of q prime to the lowest order in perturbation theory. To the first order, what I had was a delta alpha beta, 2 pi to the d delta function q plus q prime, divided by t plus k q squared. Now note that all of these factors are present in the two terms that I had calculated as corrections. So I can factor this out and write it as the correction as 1 plus or minus something. It is proportional to u. The coefficient is 4n plus 8, which I will write as 4n plus 2. I took out one factor of t plus k q squared. There is one factor that will be remaining, therefore, t plus k q squared. And then I have one integration over some variable. Let's call it k. It doesn't matter what I call the integration variable. 1 over t plus k k squared and so forth. And presumably, there will be higher order terms. Okay. Now again, I did the calculation specifically for the Landau Ginzburg, but the procedure you would have been able to do for any field theory, you could have started with the part that you can solve exactly, and then uh, look at perturbations and corrections. Now, there is, in fact, a reason why this correction that we calculated had exactly the same structure of delta functions as the original one, and why I anticipate that higher order terms, if I were to calculate, will preserve that structure. And the reason has to do with symmetries. Because quite generally, I can write for anything m alpha m beta of q prime without doing perturbation theory. Again, let's uh, remember m alphas of q are going to be related to uh, m of x by inverse Fourier transformation. So m alpha of q, I can write an integral d dx uh, e to the, I guess by that convention, it has to be minus i q dot x, m alpha of x. And then m beta of q prime, I can write as minus i q prime dot x prime, and I integrate also over an x prime. 
of m alpha of x and beta of x prime. Now these are evaluated in real space as opposed to Fourier space. And the average goes over here. Okay. At this stage, I don't say anything about perturbation theory, Gaussian, etc. What I expect is that this is a function that in a system that has translational symmetry only depends on x minus x prime. Bit. Furthermore, in a system that has rotational symmetry that is not spontaneously broken, that is approaching from the high temperature side, then just rotational symmetry forces you that the only tensor that you have has to be proportional to delta alpha beta. So I can pick some particular component, let's say M1, and I can write it in this fashion. Okay, so that the rotational symmetry explains the delta alpha beta. Now, knowing that the function that I'm integrating over two variables actually only depends on the relative position, means that I can re-express this in terms of the relative and center of mass coordinates. So I can express that expression as e to the minus i q minus q prime x minus x prime over 2. And then I will write it as minus i q plus q prime x plus x prime over 2. If you expand those, you will see that all of the cross terms will vanish, and I will get q dot x and q prime dot x prime. Yes? Yes, thank you. Right. So now I can change integration variables to the relative uh, coordinate and the center of mass coordinate rather than integrating over x and x prime. Uh, the integration over the center of mass, the x plus x prime variable, couples to q plus q prime. So it will immediately tell me that the answer has to be proportional to q plus q prime. I had already established that there is a delta alpha beta. So the only thing that is left is the integration over the relative coordinate of e to the minus i uh, some uh, q, uh, either one of them, q dot r. Since q prime is minus q, I can replace it with e to the i q dot the relative coordinate, m1 of r, m1 of 0. Okay. So that's why for a system that has translational symmetry and rotational symmetry, this structure of the delta functions is really imposed for this type of expectation value. Naturally, perturbation theory has to uh, uh, obey that. But then this is a quantity that we had encountered before, right? You recall when we were scattering light out of the system, the amplitude of something that was scattered was proportional to the Fourier transform of the correlation function. And furthermore, in the limit where s is evaluated for q equals to 0, what we are doing is we are essentially integrating the correlation function. And we've seen that the integrals of correlation functions correspond to the susceptibilities. Right? So 
you may have thought that what I was calculating was a two-point correlation function in perturbation theory, but what I was actually leading up to is to know what the result is for scattering from this theory. And in some limit of it, I've also calculated what the susceptibility is, how the susceptibility is correct. Okay. Again, if you recall the typical structure that people see for S of Qs is that S of Q is something like 1 over something like this. This is the Lorentzian line shapes that we had in scatterings. And clearly, the Lorentzian line shape is obtained by Fourier transformation and expectation values of these expansions that we make. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that rather than looking at this quantity, I should look at its inverse. So I have calculated S of Q which is the formula that I have up there. So this whole thing here, uh, oops, is S of Q. If I calculate its inverse, what do I get? First of all, I have to invert this. I have T plus K Q squared which is what uh, would have given me the Lorentzian if I were to invert it. And now we have found the correction to the Lorentzian, if you like, which is this object raised to the power of minus 1. But recall that I've only calculated things to lowest order in u. So whenever I see something and I'm inverting it, just like I did over here, I better be consistent to order of u. So to order of u, I can take this thing from the numerator, bring it to the num uh, from denominator to numerator at the expense of just changing the sign. u squared that we haven't really bothered to calculate. Okay. So now it's nice because you can see that when I expand this, this factor will cancel that factor. So the inverse has the structure that we would like. It is t plus uh, something that is a constant, doesn't depend on q. 4n plus 2u, but well, actually, no, uh, yeah, because this denominator gets canceled. I will get 4n plus 2u integral over k 2 pi to the d, 1 over t plus k, k squared, and so forth. And then I have my k q squared. And presumably, I will have higher order terms both in u, in higher powers of q, etc. And in particular, the inverse of the susceptibility is simply the first part. Forget about the kq squared. So the inverse of susceptibility is t plus 4 n plus 2 u integral d d k 2 pi to the d 1 over t plus k k squared and so forth plus order of things that we haven't computed. Okay. So why is it interesting to look at susceptibility? Because susceptibility is one of the quantities, it always has to be positive, 
that we were associating previously with the singular behavior. And uh, in the absence of the perturbative correction from the Gaussian, the susceptibility we calculated many times, it was simply uh, 1 over t. If I had added the field, the field h would have changed the free energy by an amount that would be h squared over 2t, as we saw. Take two derivatives, I will get 1 over t for the susceptibility. So the zeroth order susceptibility that I will indicate by cop chi sub 0 was something that was diverging at t equals to 0. And we were identifying the critical exponent of the divergence as gamma equals to 1. So this was here. I would have added gamma 0 equals to 1 because of the linear divergence. And the linear divergence can be traced back to the linearity of the vanishing of the inverse susceptibility at temperature. OK. Now let's see whether we've calculated a correction to gamma. Well, the first thing that you notice that if I evaluated the new chi inverse at 0, all I need to do is to put 0 in this formula. I will get 4 n plus 2 u, this integral d d k 2 pi to the d, 1 over k k squared. I said t equals to 0 here. OK? Now this is uh, indeed an integral that if I integrate all the way to infinity would diverge on me. I have to put an upper cutoff. Uh, it's a simple integral. I can write it as uh, uh, integral 0 to lambda uh, dk k to the d minus 1 with some surface uh, of a d-dimensional sphere. I have this 2 pi to the d out front. And I have a k squared here. I can put the k out here. So you can see that uh, this is an integral that's just a power. I can simply do that. The answer ultimately will be 4n plus 2 uh, u. Uh, SD 2 pi to the D, there's a factor of 1 over K that comes into play. The integral of this will give me the upper cutoff to the D minus 2 divided by D minus 2. Okay? So what we find is that uh, the corrected susceptibility to lowest order does not diverge at t equals to 0. Its inverse is a finite value. right? So actually, you can see that I've added something positive to the denominator, to, so the value of susceptibility is always reduced. So what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, the susceptibility does not uh, have a singularity anymore? The answer is no. It's just that the location of the singularity has changed. The presence of um to the fourth gives some additional stiffness that you have to overcome. t equals to 0 is not sufficient for you. You have to go to some other point tc. So I expect that this thing will actually diverge at a new point tc that is negative. And if it diverges, then its inverse will be 0. So I have to solve the equation Tc plus 4n plus 2u integral ddk 2 pi to the d of 1 over Tc plus k, k squared, and so forth. OK? So this seems like an implicit in equation in Tc, because I have to evaluate the integral that depends on Tc, and then have to set that function to 0. But again, we've calculated things only correctly to order of u. And you can see already that Tc is proportional to u. So this answer here is something that is order of u, presumably. And 
a u compared to the u out front will give me a correction that is order of u squared. So I can ignore this thing that is over here. Okay. So to order of u, I know that tc is actually minus what I had calculated before. So I get that tc is minus this 4n plus 2u ksd lambda to the d minus 2, 2 pi to the d, d minus 2. It doesn't matter what it is. It's some non-universal value. Point is that, again, the location of the phase transition certainly will depend on the parameters that you put in your theory. We readjusted our theory by putting m to the fourth. And certainly, that will change the location of the transition. So this is what we found. The location of the transition is not universal. However, we kind of hope and expect that the singularity, the divergence of susceptibility, has a form that is universal. There is an exponent that is characteristic of that. So asking the question of how this corrected chi divergence diverges at this TC is the same as asking the question of how its inverse vanishes at TC. So what I'm interested in is to find out what the behavior of chi inverse is in the vicinity of the point that it goes to 0. So basically, what this singularity is. This is, of course, 0. By definition, chi inverse of Tc is 0. So I'm asking how chi vanishes its inverse when I approach Tc. OK, so I have the formula for chi once I substitute T, once I substitute Tc, and I subtract them. To lowest order, I have T minus Tc. To next order, I have this 4un plus 2 integral over k, 2 pi to the d. I have uh, for uh, chi inverse of t, 1 over t plus k, k squared, minus 1 over tc plus k, k squared. And terms that I have not calculated are certainly order of u squared. Okay. Now you can see that if I combine these two into the same denominator that is the product, in the numerator I will get a factor of t minus tc. The kq squares cancel. So I can factor out this t minus tc between the two terms. Both terms vanish at t equals to tc. And then I can look at what the correction is to 1, just like I did before. The correction is going to, actually, this would give me Tc minus T. So I will have a minus 4un plus 2 integral d dk 2 pi to the d, the product of two of these factors, T plus k, uh, Tc plus k, k squared, T plus k k squared, and then order of u squared. OK? Happy with that? Now again, this Tc we've calculated is order of u. And consistently to calculating things to order of u, I can drop that. And again, consistently to doing things to order of u, I can add a tc here. And that's also a correction that is order of u. And this answer would not change. The justification of what I, why I choose to do that will become apparent shortly. But it's consistent at this level. So what I find at this stage is that I need to evaluate an integral of this form. All right. 
And again, with all of these integ integrals, we better take a look as to what the most significant contribution of to the integral is. And clearly, if I look at k goes to 0, uh, there, is, there are various uh, factors out there that said as long as t minus tc is positive, I will have no worries because uh, this k squared will be killed off by factors of uh, k to the t minus 1 in dimensions above 2. But if I go to large k values, I find that large k values, the singularity is governed by k to the power of d minus 4. So as long as I'm dealing uh, with things that have some upper cutoff, I don't have to worry about it even in dimensions greater than 4. In dimensions greater than 4, what happens is that the integral is going to be dominated by the largest values of k. But that those largest values of k will be cut off by lambda. The answer ultimately will be proportional to 1 over k squared. And then uh, k to the power of d minus 4 replaced by lambda to the d minus 4, various overall coefficient of d minus 4 or whatever. It doesn't matter. On the other hand, if you go to dimensions less than 4, again, larger than 2, but I won't write that for the time being, then uh, the behavior at large k is perfectly convergent. So you are integrating a function that goes up, comes down. You can extend the uh, integration all the way to infinity, end up with a definite integral. We can rescale all of our factors of k to find out what that definite integral is dependent on. And essentially, what it does is it replaces this lambda with the characteristic value of k that corresponds roughly to the maximum. And that's going to occur at something like uh, uh, t minus tc over k. Uh, to the power of 1 half, so I will get d minus 4 over 2. There is some overall definite integral that I have to do, which will give me some numerical coefficient. But at this time, let's forget about the numerical coefficient. Let's see what the structure is. So the structure then is that chi inverse of t uh, the singularity that it has is t minus tc to the zeroth order. Same thing as you would have predicted for the Gaussian. And then we have a correction, which is this minus uh, something that goes after all of these things with some coefficient. I don't care what that coefficient is. un plus 2 divided by k squared and then multiplied by lambda to the power of d minus 4, or t minus tc over k to the power of d minus 4 over 2, and then presumably higher order terms. And whether you have the top or the bottom will depend on d greater than 4 or d less than. Okay. So you see the problem. If I'm above four dimensions, this term is governed by the upper cutoff, but the upper cutoff is just some constant. So all that happens is that the dependence remains as being proportional to t minus tc. The overall amplitude is corrected by something that depends on you. You are not worried. You say that the leading singularity is the same thing as I had before. Gamma will stay to be 1. 
I try to do that in less than four dimensions, and I find that as I approach TC, the correction that I had actually itself becomes divergent. So now I have to throw out my entire perturbation theory because I thought I was making an expansion in quantity that I can make sufficiently small. So in usual perturbation theory, you say choose epsilon less than 10 to the minus 100 or whatever, and then things will be small correction to what you had at zeroth order. Here I can choose my u to be as small as I like. Once I approach TC, the correction will blow up. So this is called a divergent perturbation theory. Yes? So could we have known a priori that we couldn't get a correction to gamma from the perturbation theory because the only way for gamma to change is for the correction to have a divergence? Uh, you are presuming that that's what happens. So indeed, if you knew that there is a divergence with an exponent that is larger than gamma, you probably could have guessed that you wouldn't have get, get it this way. But this, let's say that we are choosing to proceed mathematically without prior knowledge of what the experimentalists have told us. Then, then we can discover it this way. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If you're, if you're looking for how gamma changes due to the higher order things, if we found that our perturbation uh, diverged with a lower exponent than gamma, then the leading one would still be the original gamma Absolutely. we got. And then if yes. it's higher, then we have the same problem. That's right. Yeah. So the problem that we have is actually to somehow make sense of this type of perturbation theory. And as you say, it's correct. We could have actually guessed, and I'll give you another reason why uh, the perturbation theory would not have worked. But the only thing that we can really do is perturbation theory. So we have to be clever and figure out a way of making sense of this perturbation theory, which we will do by combining it with the normalization group. But a better way or another way to have seen maybe why this does not work is good old fashioned dimensional analysis. I have within the exponent of the weight that I wrote down terms that are of this form. Tm squared, k gradient of m squared, um to the fourth, and so forth. Since whatever is in the exponent should be dimensionless, I usually write beta h, for example, we know that this t has some dimension, square the dimension of m, multiply by length to the d, this should be dimensionless. Similarly, k, m squared again, because of the gradient l to the d minus 2, that combination should be dimensionless. And my u, m to the fourth, L to the D should be dimensionless. Okay? So we can get rid of the dimensions of M by dividing, let's say, UM to the fourth with the square of KM squared. So we can immediately see that U divided by K squared, I get rid of the dimensions of M. L to the power of d, L to the d, 2d minus 4, giving me L to the 4 minus d is dimensionless. Right? So any perturbation theory that I write down, ultimately, where I have some quantity x, which is its zeroth order 1, and then I want to make a correction where u appears, I should have something u over k squared and then some power of length to make the dimensions work out. So what length do I have available to me? One length that I have is my microscopic length, a. So I could have put here a to the power of 4 minus d. 
But there is also an emergent length in the problem, which is the correlation length. And there is no reason why the dimensionless form that involves the correlation length should not appear. And indeed, what we have over here, to zero to order, our correlation length had the exponent 1 half divergence. So this is really the zero to order correlation length that is raised to the power of 4 minus d. So even before uh, doing the calculation, we could have guessed on dimensional ground that it is quite possible that we are expanding in u, we think. But at the end of the day, we are expanding in u c to the power of 4 minus d. And there is no way that that's a small quantity on approaching the phase transition. And that hit us on the face. And also is the reason why I replaced this t over here with t minus tc, because the only place where I expect singularities to emerge in any of these expansions is at tc. I arrange things so that it would appear at the right place. So should we throw out perturbation theory completely? Since the only thing that we can do is really perturbation theory, well, we have to be clever about it. And that's what we will do next lectures. <laughs>